Ron Fenchak, Senior Associate Director, Presbyterian Hospital Foundation. Well, my wife and I actually first met Mary down at the uh, Science Museum in Discovery Place, and we were attending a uh, grand opening for Alexander Julian, who is a native North Carolinian, and uh, they had these, uh, we wandered into a room and we saw Mary and her husband standing there with these exotic birds, and we instantly grabbed our attention, and it was amazing. And then as we gradually inch toward them, uh, not knowing how the birds would respond in such a, a, a loud uh, area, we were just uh, enthralled by them. And then Mary has such a great way of explaining things, of not only about the birds, but about uh, their calming effects on the people. And so it was a very positive experience. So I ended up calling Mary later, uh, the next day. Discovery Place educator, Ann Meadows. Well, dealing with environmental issues uh, as I'm doing day by day, I was very impressed uh, with the way she went about handling uh, tropical birds. Uh, and in seeing some of her demonstrations that she did and in helping her, uh, I really feel that this is an important concept that she's trying to get over to the general public. Hi, my name is Tammy Myers. I'm employed by First Assembly Living Center as the activity director. The fact that you're viewing this program right now means that you're interested in the Tropics Bird Refuge Program. And I know I speak for myself and many other individuals and institutions when I say that your interest is greatly appreciated because without financial su support of people like yourselves or the organizations you may represent, the invaluable work being done by Mary Bradford and the tropics would certainly not be able to continue. Not only have I witnessed the love and dedication Mary puts into caring for these unwanted, abused, neglected, or handicapped tropical birds, I've also seen the profound positive effect these birds have when properly used for educational and therapeutic purposes. Through this short program, you will be able to witness for yourselves the level of expertise Mary demonstrates in handling these birds along with her commitment to community service through the tropics. And just as important, you will also see the major benefit to the public at large in having an organization such as the tropics to perform such an important community service. Again, thank you for your interest in the tropics and please consider supporting this fine organization in any way you can because it means so much to facilities such as ours. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Tropics. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to the health and welfare of tropical pet birds. As you well know, we have programs in place to protect our natural wildlife, such as birds of prey. But in our case, we do the same thing by protecting pet birds that have either been born with birth defects, have been injured, abused, or neglected or that need homes because of situations within families that change. Either they cannot take care of their bird any longer or there's a death in the family, whatever the case may be. Another facet of our program is public education. In that, we take birds to public schools, private schools, daycare centers, retirement and senior citizens groups, and educate them about the proper care of birds. that the hen kept throwing the nesting material out of the nest and the egg would wind up laying on the wood and get cold. And so somewhere during his development within the egg, he got too cold and it caused this deformity. His legs kind of split out on him sideways and he also has trouble maneuvering around. Sometimes he'll try to get from one side to the other and that little foot will go up in the air and he can't quite get his brain to tell him to put that foot to that down so he can take a step. He uses a sun conure and his name is Sonny. He comes from Central and South America. 
He's full grown, he's two years old, but he does not talk. And I don't know why he doesn't talk. He just never has developed the vocabulary. Yeah, she can fly, but her, she doesn't like to have her wings touched. You see her wings are clipped. Oh. Oh. Isn't that pretty? We only clip a couple of feathers on each wing. So she completely trusts me that I will not drop her. So that this is just a, a trust. It's not a trick. It's not anything that she was taught to do. It's just something she does. Yes, yeah, so she cut out one of her another bird. Oh. <laughs> Two feather has its own blood supply. And so when he plucks, when he plucks um, a feather out that's still in the growing process, he bleeds. And if he doesn't pluck it out cleanly, he can bleed to death. Because they, they can live, that is just like a blood vessel right there. Do, do the feathers grow back? We don't think he'll, his feathers will grow back because he's been plucking himself for two years and we think the little feather follicles in, in his skin are damaged to the point where he can't grow any feathers again. What's important about what she does? Yeah, that she takes good care of them and gives them a good home. Cause some people, some people went and like to take take the birds in, take care of them. Well, we saw a lot of birds today. With uh, most of them had mid and um, physical um, handicaps, and um, and uh, the, almost the best part about it was uh, the the way you got to pass them out. And then you got to talk to them and, and just see what they were like and stuff. Students were able to see birds outside of their natural habitats. They were brought into the classroom. A lot of these birds came from South America. And since the students can't go there, um, she brought them here. They were able to see them uh, also outside of the pet shop. They were also see that birds like this one who's on my shoulder who is blind they have found that birds who are physically challenged can take care of themselves and they respond to people who are very um, kind to them and who take care of them and they really enjoyed it and I see a great significance for this. I believe in Mary because she cares about these birds. She'll take care of birds that nobody else wants. If they're not, if they're not perfect birds, she still wants them and she loves them and she makes a place for them in society. I thought I'd take just a brief moment to discuss with you what goes on behind the scenes here at the Tropics. The birds have a very structured lifestyle. They're in a home environment. And this is necessary because of the disabilities and handicaps and emotional problems that some of these birds have. Uh, their normal day consists of a structured feeding schedule, cage cleaning, and time out that is always supervised. We are not able to let the birds out of the cage unless they're supervised because they will either destruct the area around them or they could become further injured. Um, they're played with every day on an individual basis and they're cuddled and held and uh, we do that so that they, we, we try to make up for the things in the past that they've been through that's traumatized them or that's caused them to be disabled. Um, because of the fact that we are constantly taking in birds, we are constantly in a, an expansion mode. So as we increase in number, we will continue to expand our facilities to house more birds. They're the same as having a two or a three year old person in your home. They need a lot of taking care of. And so many times, the animal suffers because the public doesn't know how to take care of these birds. But on top of that, to be able to incorporate that with touching the senior citizens of this community plus the um, physically challenged people. I think it's a phenomenal thing that she's doing. People that are physically challenged uh, mentally or, or physically uh, and physically um, really need this type of therapy. 
live animals really do help in those situations. Probably, well, I know it's at least 250 a month, upwards to 300, just to feed them because they eat a very diverse diet. They eat table food and then they eat um, special diets that are just uh, made just for birds. Now this is what he does at home when he, when he wants to eat special treats. He sits on my shoulder and I fix a bowl of food and he just eats right out of the bowl. felt strange, not sure whether they wanted to come or not, uh, but came out of curiosity just to see the birds. And, uh, you know, I think I noticed that most of them when they left really felt good, really felt happy. And so I think it was a, a feel-good experience. But Sam was given to us because her owner was terminally sick and he knew he was dying. He wanted to find a home for Sam before he passed on. Now, in this case, Sam will not be resold. Sam will stay with us as a promise that I gave to this gentleman to give Sam a good home. Now, this is Orco. Orco is the same species as peaches, a Moluccan cockatoo. At first, in his confusion, he didn't know why his life had changed and he had plucked himself completely bare. Now, as time goes by, he has been taking more time to take care of himself a little better, but we really don't know psychologically if he'll ever be the same. He's very much of a clown. Aren't you, Orko? You a clown? I think Mary has a unique organization, uh, not only with the exotic birds, but also uh, on the effect, the immediacy of the uh, calming effect that the birds can have uh, for a wide range of people, youngsters, uh, children of all ages, all the way through to our older, more mature pa uh, patients, and I tend to say patients in the hospital, but also uh, any, any age clientele. And the birds are just wonderful and well behaved. And and just so interesting for a wide range of the population. They connect with the birds. They may not know who the people are around them, but they know that the birds are pretty and they're cuddly and they love them. And it takes their mind off of themselves and what's going on around them. It gives them something to look forward to. I really uh, firmly believe all they need to do is uh, stop by uh, basically at any time and visit with Mary and her husband and see what they do see the love and the care that they give to these animals and uh, how well these animals respond and it speaks very loudly uh, and, and it will uh, touch their heart and hopefully open up their person.
Have you ever wanted a Lutino cockatiel or a Moluccan cockatoo? How about a yellow-naped Amazon? Many people think these exotic parrots from the tropics would make good pets, but many people don't realize the enormous amount of care these special birds need. 12-year-old Chase Woodall does. He and John and Joey Newell are volunteers at the tropics, an exotic bird refuge. They take care of birds that have been given up by their previous owners. Here's their story. You have no idea how smart an exotic bird is. Each bird has a different personality. They're remarkably like humans. My name is Chase Woodall. I'm 12 years old and I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. It is estimated that there are well over 28 million exotic birds in this country. My name is Mary Bradford and I run the Tropics Exotic Bird Refuge. People purchased birds that were brought in from all around the world and some birds were used for breeding and some were tamed for pets. I'm Judy Gaynor and I breed exotic birds. A bird is a wonderful pet. They can communicate with people that a dog and a cat cannot. They talk your language. I say parrots are lousy pets for most people because they're simply not prepared to give that bird what it needs. My name is Richard Farinato and I work for the Humane Society of the United States. When people think about buying a bird, they're usually caught by the bird's beauty. What they don't know is that that bird is going to start screaming at dawn, throw seeds all over the living room, poop out the side of the cage. If a person understands what is involved in caring for that bird, they have a wonderful companion that will live with them the rest of their lives. It's very common to see people buy an animal like this and three or four years down the road decide this was a mistake. The relatively small town of Kannapolis, North Carolina holds... Chase was our very first young volunteer and he started by cleaning cages. He then became an author for our newsletter. The Tropics Exotic Bird Refuge is a haven for birds who have either been mistreated by their original owners or there's just no place for them, or they're disabled in some way. The refuge is in the Bradford's home. There's 67 birds here now. Well, one of them had an accident and he is handicapped. All he has is his upper body. Georgie is our blind macaw. She's 15 years old. Luke is a scarlet macaw, which is very endangered, and he is 60 years old. Orca, who is originally from the zoo, he was actually attacked by another bird, and that led to feather plucking. Another zoo bird that we have here is Ringer. He plucked his feathers out. These two birds cannot grow their feathers back because their skin has been destroyed. Being locked up in a cage, never being able to come out would be boring, and that's why birds pluck a lot of times. My name is Joy Newell. I am 11 years old, and this is my brother, John Newell. We volunteer at the Exotic Bird Refuge because we think it's a great opportunity to help birds. Birds in captivity need a great deal of affection and attention. In the wild, when they select a mate, they are with their mate constantly. In captivity, they depend on humans for that contact. We compare an exotic bird in captivity to that of a two to four year old child, both in emotion and intelligence. One of the key things we do to educate people is to go to schools. There he goes. <laughs> I'm Tiffany Milstead. I go to Mount Pleasant Elementary School. Now Caesar is an African Gray. I feel sorry for the birds because most birds fly like 500 miles every day and they don't get to fly at all when they're in a cage. Our birds are kept in cages temporarily. In the near future, we hope to have an aviary, which will be a semi-enclosed environment where the birds can be allowed free flight. Many times we're asked if these birds can be reintroduced to the wild, and the current answer is no. Birds that are in the pet trade now are completely dependent upon humans. They're living a life like we want them to, but not their natural way of living, and that's what's injuring our birds. There are still plenty of forested areas where these birds could do very well. One of the things you need to realize is that it's not just the loss of a forest where they live that's causing them to have problems. It's the fact that they're so heavily captured as pets or for the pet trade. Their populations are so badly affected that they simply won't exist if we keep bringing them in. In 1993, a law was passed which made it illegal to bring certain kinds of exotic birds into the United States. 
Today, though most exotic birds in this country are born in captivity, many are still being smuggled in illegally. These birds need to just be left alone and left in their natural habitat. And we need to also stop killing the rainforest so they stay in that natural habitat. If an individual is dead set on getting a bird, then they should think about a much smaller bird, like a parakeet. Not the big macaws, not the cockatoos, not the Amazon parrots. People that already own pet birds should not feel guilty of that fact. I think the best thing they can do for their pets is to give them plenty of exercise and toys, a good diet. They need to be held and be played with. Last summer, this refuge had 45 birds. It now has 67. You just can't keep neglecting them. I mean, somewhere it's got to stop. No video. We've got a hot show. You'll see synchronized swine, pets looking for new owners, and, well, the thing with the bird there. So stop what you're doing. It's time to get going. We'll play all the hits tonight on ASB. videos the only show on TV that guarantees is only for a moment to make you feel better about your own life that's right Daisy and we have got a great show tonight um, let me guess some funny videos uh, actually no we have Martha Stewart to come out and show us how to make some beautiful antique furniture out of popsicle sticks <laughs> great I'll wait in my dressing room oh, don't do that baby okay you forced me to show more videos Martha take your sticks and get out <laughs> Oh, you've always wanted to say that to her. She's really here? Yeah. Well, not anymore. Oh, not anymore. <laughs> you broke her heart. No doily for you. Oh, so, <laughs> our first topic tonight is animals. I love animals. Do you really, Daisy? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 enough. Please, I have to be serious. It's not funny. I saw this next clip for the first time a couple of days ago, and ever since, I have had the image burned into my mind. Every time I close my eyes, it is there. I can't sleep at night because of this clip. I am haunted by this clip. I have lost my appetite. I break out in cold sweats. I need professional help to get this out of my head. So here it is. Enjoy it. Oh, great night. What parrot, Dad? We don't see any parrots. Slow down, bud. In Greek mythology, there are two of those guarding the gates of hell. After a hard day at the office, there's nothing like a pet to soothe you and calm your nerves. must have been a hard decision at the store. Pussycat or Screaming Banshee? Thank you very much for indulging me. I think seeing it one more time has finally got it burned out of my head. It was very cathartic. <laughs> ah, oh, great. Now I got that badge the bones. Anyway, as I was saying before I was rudely interrupted, it's contest time. Some amateur videographer is going to leave here a professional with an asking price of $10,000, okay? You guys will be voting for one of the following clips, okay? 
Moby Dork, sent in by Maddie Toom from Mason, Ohio. Look at that. You get this? Oh, look at that. Oh. Apparently, the fish doesn't like being impaled by a giant hook. <laughs> Rodent Roundup sent in by Robert Wolfman from Brona, New Jersey. All you need to know here is that these people are trying to catch a mouse. Oh! <laughs> Ralph, put it down. Put it down. Ralph. Get, get the container, Ralph, as it's... <laughs> or cockatoo steps sent in by Mary Bradford from Kannapolis, North Carolina. Uh, what parrot, Dad? We don't see any parrot. In Greek mythology, there are two of those guarding the gates of hell. Okay, you're right. Boat already. Now. One of these clips is worth $10,000. If you flip away now, you won't know which one. Can you live with that? Counted, and I have the results right here. All right, well, let's vote on whether or not you want me to read it, okay? <laughs> All right, never mind. Just kidding. Our second place winner is Moby Dork, sent in by Maddie Toon from Mason, Ohio. <laughs> and the winner of the $10,000 prize is Two steps and then by Mary Bradford from Kannapolis, North Carolina. Oh, well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Hi, honey. Can you say hello? Say hello. <laughs> okay, say Daisy. Okay, let's not. <laughs> so this is great. Can he can you get him to do this for us now? Not right now. Well, he just does it on his own, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just happen to have the camera roll. You yeah. see what I tell you guys all the time? <laughs> well, this is great. What are you going to do with the money? It's 10000 bucks. Well, we've got 70 refuge birds to take care of. I'm going to build them an aviary. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's very nice. I love that. Well, congratulations. You know when I'll see you next, don't you? And the when? When you go up for $100,000. We can build a bigger one then. <laughs> yes, we can. Congratulations, John. <laughs> shares their space with snakes. Some birds of a feather are rescued together. A cat that puts dogs to the test and a fashion show for llamas. Plus the touching story of a dog's life saved by a little ingenuity and a lot of love. They're ordinary animals that do extraordinary things and they're all on America's Greatest Pets. Please welcome one of Hollywood's most respected animal experts. A veteran of over 30 top Hollywood movies, Jules Sylvester. Plus captivating actress and pet lover extraordinaire, Allie Landry. Hi, I'm Allie Landry. And I'm Jules Sylvester. Welcome to America's Greatest Pets, the show that celebrates the human inside our favorite animals. And this time, we're filled to capacity with hilarious and heartwarming pets. That's me, hilarious and heartwarming. You're not a pet. No, but I got great shots and great hairy legs. <laughs> I have noticed, but listen, let's get on to it with one of America's greatest pets. Incredible. And here's something else you'll find pretty amazing. <whistles> hey. What? Mary Bradford of Kannapolis, North Carolina, loves birds. <whistles> Exotic birds. She and her husband, John, have turned their home into a sanctuary for handicapped and special needs birds. And today, they have a total of 110 birds. 
I know the story of each and every bird. Uh, people are amazed. I can even recognize their, their voices and their calls. Okay, go! Dance, Coco! Mary's lifelong commitment to each and every one of her birds is 100%. And it all started with a phone call. In 1990, a local pet store that knew us very well called us and said they had a handicapped bird that they needed to find a home for. Since that day, Mary's never looked back. Our count rose from one in 1990 to today we have 110. It's a lot of work. It's very tiring, but it's so rewarding. Did you know I love you? Yes, I'm so thankful I got you. I think the birds give me unconditional love. And, um, and I give it back to them. It's hard to explain. It's such an emotional situation between the birds and I that I think it can only be experienced. I don't think it can be put into words. Coming up on America. Oh, this forecast looks fantastic. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Thanks Al. Thanks a lot, Al. All right, well, a very special nursing home in Kannapolis will get an exposure across the country next month. They're going to get it from National Geographic. Now, this home is for the birds, literally. <laughs> it's called Tropics Exotic Bird Refuge. And tonight, WBTV's Edward Lawrence shows us just why it's so unique. Hi. <laughs> Most people would not appreciate a jungle near home. Yeah, she's a hand. Mary Bradford and her husband, John, are not most people. Yeah. We take in handicapped and unwanted pet birds. Oh, the Bradfords run the nation's first nonprofit parrot refuge. Now, she's a um, military macaw, which is native to um, Central and South America. They are on the endangered list. There are 139 birds here from exotic places like Africa and South America. I know every one of them's name, and I can recognize their voices just because I'm their mom. <laughs> this mother's love runs so deep, she and her husband helped sick birds. Barney plucked himself to the extent where he can't regrow anymore. As well as handicapped birds. Sleepy thinks that he's perfectly normal. He's never had sight, therefore he doesn't know that he's missing something. This little conure is named Petey. His, he has a hip dysplasia. He's, he cannot walk. This love has taken off. Already the Bradfords have quickly outgrown this aviary. As soon as they get enough money, they plan to build a simulated rainforest outside in the backyard. We're finding that we have the same problem with unwanted birds as we have with unwanted dogs and cats. Coco, That's why this couple travels nationwide to save these birds. I think we were chosen to do it because we, had, we didn't plan on doing this. It just happened. There you go. Hi, Coco. Edward Lawrence, WBTV News, Kannapolis. They are the cutest thing. <laughs> That's great. Well, the Bradfords also use the birds for educating school children, and they spend time with the elderly and the handicapped. Mm -hmm. Where parrots and people take their relationships seriously. But when Polly gets aggressive, an affectionate pet can turn a household upside down. He can bite hard enough that he could probably take her finger off. See how far some owners will go to save a rocky relationship. Then, on the big picture. Explorer is brought to you by Ford, maker of vehicles that are built to last. Hello, and welcome to Explorer. First up this week, we have a love story gone awry. Now, for many pet owners, there is nothing quite like a parrot. They're colorful, they're witty, they're clever, but that same intelligence can also wreak havoc. Their shrieks can be ear-splitting, and their attacks can be painful. Right now, we're headed out there to answer a troubling question. What happens when Polly no longer wants a cracker, but wants to take a bite out of you? Hi. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. Buenos dias. Buongiorno. Greetings. This is the story of parrots and people. Don't be asked. 
a relationship like no other. It isn't hard to figure out why parrots are one of the most popular of all pets, or why people love them so much. I love you. What's the rest you say? Oh my God, I'm pregnant. <laughs> But not all parrots are birds of paradise. They'll bite you. They'll crap all over the place. They'll crap in their food cup. They can make people unhappy. Why is it that some parrots seem to stop loving people back? Wreaking havoc in their lives, literally biting the hand that feeds them. They're the rainbows of the jungle. From dazzling macaws to pocket-sized parakeets, parrots mesmerize us with their beauty and their brains. Over 300 species of parrots span the earth. We are so enamored of them that we take them into our world or breed them far from their natural homes. The result is a complex relationship. One that's been around for a while. Throughout history, parrots have been admired by people all over the world. In parts of medieval Europe, they were regarded as holy because of their seemingly miraculous ability to speak. During the Renaissance, the luckiest talked their way into the most divine nest, the Vatican. And who looked after them? The keeper of the parrots. By the 16th century, parrots were so prized among the European elite that they were invited to grace their master's portraits. And especially pampered ones sat for their very own portraits. Centuries later, parrots became more popular pets and were seen as the playful mimic. Witty, but not too bright. But how do we perceive and understand them today? Perhaps more importantly, how do they see us? Whatever the answer, one thing's for sure. Parrots and some of their people take their relationships very seriously. This is Rio when he was a baby, about under a year old. So he's really turned into a beautiful adult bird. I've had him for eight and a half years, and he used to be the biggest little log. He was just this great, loving little pet. He's so darn cute. I mean, when the phone rings and he says hello and has a one-sided conversation with himself. Hello. Hi, Rio. Good boy, Riri. For five years, Sally Garrett had a loving relationship yeah. with Rio, a Little yellow to Amazon. He has these adorable tiny little eyelashes around his eye and it is just so cute but Ooh, then everything eyelash. changed fun and affection gave way to terror and he started to really bite me the trouble began when a new player entered the picture Lon Bolenbacher. When I first met Sally, I was sort of afraid of the bird because she said, you know, he, he, he'll, he'll bite you. But Lon wanted Sally, so he did his best to court her bird as well. Over time, I just spent a lot of time with him and always got him excited. And sooner or later, he just kind of decided that he liked me better. Hi. 
No, coffee's not good for you. Lon's ploy worked no, all too well. He really started to love my husband and chose him over me. And <laughs> now, my sweet little bird I could do anything with, I can hardly interact with at all. It really, it just feels like you're getting dumped. I mean, it feels terrible because you love him. You do everything for him. You feed him. I mean, you can feed him his favorite food, and then he'll turn around to try and bite you. And it is. It's a feeling of rejection. After three years of marriage, Lon and Sally fear their family may not stay together after all. The pet they'd expected to keep forever may have to go. Hi, sweetie. How did it come to this? How could a two-pound bird cause so much trouble and pain? It seems the problem isn't just between Sally and Rio. Aki and Julie Tomasis, and this is our double yellow-headed Amazon sky. The problem is a misunderstanding between people and parrots, which at times can lead to serious conflict. I'm Sue Farlow, and I'm the bird behavior school teacher. I'm staying with Walkies. And the first step to healing any relationship is to admit you have a problem in the first place. This is my... Amazon. Family troubles like those between Rio and his owners are so widespread, they've spawned a therapeutic industry that even dispenses Prozac for parrots. I think many, many people feel very isolated with their bird issues. Sue Farlow is a bird behaviorist who helps parrot keepers contend with problems such as biting, dive bombing, and self-destructive feather plucking. Pluck Sue encourages talk therapy, but not for the parrots. They drive you out of your mind sometimes. It's kind of like having an attack parrot. He gave me 11 stitches in my cheek. Owners are often mystified by the complexity of their parrots. As in marriage counseling, Sue coaches her clients to see things from their partner's point of view. What's going on? No. Who's at fault? Parrots or people? What does the duck say? Quack, quack, quack. Yeah. Next, the results are in, and one parrot's grades have amazed the public. How many? Two. Two is right. Good boy. Just how smart are our feathered friends? Find out when Explorer returns on TBS Superstation. Explorer. If imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, it would seem that parrots adore us. But their amazing talents make it easy to forget that parrots and people are very different. Whether free or captive, parrots are wild at heart. Unlike most other pets, they lack a long history of domestication. Even their talent for speech reflects no special resemblance to humans, just an instinct they bring from the wild. What toy? See. It's not in the rainforest, but in the groves of academe, where cognitive biologist Irene Pepperberg has spent over two decades trying to figure out what makes parrots tick and talk. How many green Four. Good birdie. In the wild, they are almost always in, in flocks. Um, remember, these are prey animals, and if you're in a flock, you're much safer. When we take them into captivity, what they do is start to treat us as their flock, and they start to mimic and reproduce our vocalizations because that helps them integrate into the flock. Life may be okay in the suburbs or the city, but it's a far cry from the great outdoors. For one, wild parrots are hardly ever alone. They show a strong dependence on the flock as a whole. And they typically couple up into tightly bonded pairs. Many favor long-term relationships, often for life. Which for some species can mean 40 years or more. But in captivity, how a parrot will behave and just who it might bond with can be hard to predict. Back at Sally and Lon's nest, things are getting worse. 
Leo is growing increasingly hostile to his former favorite human, Sally. Perhaps Rio is staking a claim to his newly chosen partner, Lon, forcing Sally down a notch in the pecking order. To make things worse, Rio isn't responding favorably to the newest member of the flock. Once the baby came, and we said we can't stop the biting. He can bite hard enough that he could probably take her finger off. We really tried hard to make it work. We had someone come as a personal pet trainer and try and work it out. In the wild, Rio's actions would be appropriate, but in Detroit, they aren't playing very well. Unfortunately, we can't trust him anymore. Here you go. How is it that a creature with a brain not much bigger than a peanut is able to manipulate complex relationships and sabotage an entire family? Turns out these bird brains aren't bird brains after all. At the University of Arizona, Dr. Pepperberg and Alex the African Gray have collaborated on a project that has yielded some astonishing discoveries. Alex and I have quite, quite an interesting relationship, but certainly he's not my pet and he's not my lab subject. After 21 years of studying this bird, we're basically Come colleagues. Back. On the tray, what sound is yellow? What sound is yellow? Or. Or. Very good. Whoa, whoa, very Dr. Good. Pepperberg has amazed the scientific community by showing that much of the time, Alex actually knows what he's talking about. Many of the tests we've given Alex are specifically designed to avoid mimicry. So, for example, I had given two objects. If he were just mimicking, he would say something about the two objects. But he answers specific questions. He can tell me how many. He can tell me what's same, what's different what color bigger, what color smaller, or what matter bigger, or what matter smaller. How many? Two. Two is right. Good boy. Can you tell me what's different? What's different? Four. That's right. Oh, we oh, dropped one. Okay. What color bigger? What color bigger? None. None. Very good. Okay. Good boy. Treat? Yeah. Well, you want to, you Simply to put, Alex can identify a single object many ways demonstrating cognitive abilities similar to those in right, four Alex, to five-year-old humans. Number, what number is green? Four. That's right. Good boy. Four. The way that the birds are developing their communication skills is not too different from the way children develop. And that's very surprising given the fact that these birds have completely different brain structures than we do. Parrots may be as smart as kindergartners, but most owners would agree that they're two-year-olds at heart. Like most toddlers, parrots seem to need constant attention and affection, and we're happy to go to great lengths to indulge them. So that as the bird poops, the pouch pulls away from their vent, and they don't get any, any poop on their vent or their feathers for up to four to six hours at a time. And this little piggy had none. Oh, these little piggies went. Oh, very nice. Como estas? Como estas? He, he imitates the dogs a lot. <laughs> lie down, Misa. Now, lie down. Misa, come on out. Lie down. Good girl. Beep, 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 you know. Well, it sounds uh, like a truck backing up. <laughs> yeah, my wife passed on three years ago. Rube learned how to say Joe in my wife's voice. So birds are our love. We don't have children. We have birds. And uh, we wouldn't be without them. We know the day she hatched, May 27th. Look at the chicken. <gasps> uh, she has a trust fund. She has uh, her own bank account. God bless America. What is the duck?
There's a cat. Yeah. She loves to sing God, and it's real bright. God. God. Home. 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 Very good. That was better. That was better. That was well. correct. Yeah. That was correct. Yeah. Many owners delight in their parrot's cleverness. Yet it is this very same quality that enables parrots to turn our lives upside down. When that happens, working things out takes a serious investment of time and even courage. Opie loves Kathy. Kathy loves Opie. Tom loves Kathy. Opie. Tom. He thinks I'm trying to steal his girlfriend. <laughs> Kathy and Opie have been together for eight years. Now Tom and Kathy want to get married and move in together. But like Rio, Opie won't tolerate this disruption of his flock's order. <laughs> and Tom won't move in until Opie stops attacking him. Get the cauterizer. I'll have to get you some ice. <laughs> getting bit by him is not like, it's not like getting bit by a dog. It's, it's like getting your finger closed in the door. It's like, crush. I think it's more like a pair of pliers. <laughs> Kathy is trying very hard. But could a day come when she's forced to choose between the man she loves and Opie the parrot? I love him dearly. I really do. Um, I don't know what keeps me trying and going. He would certainly never give up on me. I would never give up on him. <laughs> But many people do give up. Often they buy their pet on impulse, ignorant of the demands it imposes on them. This is a very, very long time commitment. But dog owners 14 years. This guy could live to be 80. What happens to unwanted parrots? In New York City, the luckier birds end up in Martin Finkelstein and Ethel Bookbinder's one-bedroom apartment, which has become a sort of parrot refuge. We somehow have some compatibility with them, or at least we think we do, because we keep them and they thrive here. Bucky came to us from a broken marriage. The doctor came to us because of a new relationship, and they were moving out of town. Flora came to us because the lady went off to Europe to get married. We would set them free if we thought they could survive, but they can't survive. Um, you can't return them to the rainforest. They never came from the rainforest. I mean, most of these birds were probably born in New Jersey. Coming up, while some friendships can be mended, other parrots might not be as lucky when Explorer returns on TBS Superstation. Each year, countless parrots are given up by their owners, some showing signs of serious trauma. Whether neglected, orphaned, or abused, psychologically troubled parrots often exhibit disturbing behavior, such as plucking out their feathers. Many parrots outlive their owners and end up unwanted and homeless. Whatever the reason, separation from a bonded partner, be it human or feathered, drive a parrot into what appears to be a deep depression. Kathy does not want Opie to go through the trauma of separation, and she's determined to protect her fiancé from Opie's crushing beak. Kathy and Tom have called in bird shrink Sue Farlow to work on the problems with their changing flock. I want these problems to be solved before we move in together and, and that so everybody's comfortable. We can all handle Opie and nobody's going to get hurt. So for Opie, who's very bonded to Kathy, to have you come into the picture, Tom, this this is definitely a challenge to Opie. If, you, if you've ever sharpened a knife using a steel... Sue recommends Tom start with stick training. It's a way to handle the bird without getting bitten. Sticks become an extension of the arm. It makes the human feel more confident, which makes an impression on the parrot. Right. Again, just it's remember... It's going to be hard to say to go into this not nervous the first time. Sure, absolutely. Okay. See what I mean? Kathy's seen Opie attack one too many times. 
It's not easy for her to imagine peace between Tom and Opie. And you give him the command, and quickly, quickly. Step give, up. Quickly, 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 quickly. Step up. Quickly, okay, quickly. Step. Quickly. Step up, You gotta okay. give it to him. Okay, and put him down on the perch. Put him down on the perch. But the exercise works oh, as intended. Okay. It's clear he wants to make a point with you. It's also clear that there's something in the relationship that he's responding to in a very favorable way. I think what's important here for Kathy to do is to feel more comfortable that you can trust Opie and Tom to develop a relationship of their own. Goodbye, Opie. Be good. Listen to Tom. With the therapist's help, Tom and Opie are gradually starting to communicate. Bye. 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 This may become one of those households where everyone in the flock finally gets along. Bye. Lots of wooden chew toys. When therapy doesn't work, there are few options left. Lon and Sally have decided it's time for Rio to go. We would never just say, this pet doesn't work, we're getting rid of him. And if it wasn't for the safety factor with the baby, we wouldn't even be thinking of getting rid of him. Despite all the problems, they're very attached to Rio. Sending him away is as painful as separating from a close relative. And this flock is all Rio knows. We thought that this bird was going to be in our lives forever. And here we are, unfortunately, eight and a half years later, finding out that he can't be a part of our family. It's just going to be like the part of your life is missing. Just, I, I, he's not obviously dying, but it's like when any pet dies, I mean, you feel the sense of loss. We're so happy for him. If, if he was just going into, I'm um, hold on a second. It is bad, but, um, just give me a second. <laughs> I don't usually get choked up, but I am really going to miss him. After much research, Lon and Sally have chosen to entrust Rio to the care of a parrot sanctuary, 500 miles away in North Carolina. It's hard to believe you can be so nasty. Because you're so sweet to me and you look beautiful. You look like you wouldn't hurt a soul. Even though where he's going is a great place and he's going to be with other birds, I can't help but worry about him and wonder is he okay? Is he happy? Hey, big man. How are you? How was the trip? It was good. Rio. Mary Bradford and her husband John run the Tropics Exotic Bird Refuge in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Show him his new his new world. Tropics Aviary houses over 150 parrots sent here from all over the country. Can you keep an eye on Rio? He's my bird I brought down Rio's lost one family, but he's joined an even bigger one. He's already making new friends. For the first time in his adult life, he's socializing with other birds, and he seems to be handling it quite well. There's Flo. 
For centuries, parrots like Rio have provided us with entertainment and companionship. But we're only just beginning to reciprocate by learning to understand their ways, just as they so eagerly learn ours. For the producers of our story, there was an unexpected on-the-job hazard. Having to work on the set with demanding dive-bombing... Cutie, how you doing today? Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Hanna, here at my base camp, Bush Garden, Tampa Bay. Welcome to Animal Adventures. I bet you'd never guess that you could find the only retirement home for tropical birds in North Carolina. What's wrong? Oh, that's Pearson. Well, believe it. Mary Bradford has dedicated her life and opened her home to hundreds of birds. It's truly an amazing story. So off we go to Kannapolis, North Carolina, just north of Charlotte. In a state famous for brilliant colors, it seems only fitting to find some of the world's most beautiful birds. Exotic birds more commonly found in tropical places like Central and South America. As I made my way through Mary Bradford's quiet neighborhood, I didn't see any swaying palm trees. Tropics exotic bird refuge for handicapped and unwanted birds. <laughs> but I did find one very unusual birdhouse. I hear birds in there. Gotta be the right place. Well, I heard birds. Oh. Hi, Jack. How you doing? Hey, come on in. Oh, there's a bird hey, there. Todd. This is Todd. Hey, Todd. <laughs> you Golly, Jay. Oh, wow, you cooked me lunch. Yeah, well, no, afraid not. That's for the birds. I was up till midnight cooking that. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Look at the birds in here. Wow. Looks like every room in here has birds. It does, except for one bedroom and a bathroom. Jeez. <laughs> Golly, Jay. Boy, he lives out here on the porch, huh? Yeah, sunroom. Now, Jack, what we do here is we take care of handicapped birds and birds that people can no longer keep for various reasons. It's a nice nursing home. I'd like to live here. <laughs> I mean, they got good food. they got a little sun porch, couches. So you get medical care, too, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, once the vet gets done with what she has to do with them, then we take over the medical care here. What's wrong with that bird's beak? Well, actually, there's nothing wrong with it, Jack. This is a very rare slender-billed conure from South America. Uh, her name is Kiki, and the um, beak is very long, but I'm not sure why. I don't know if they did grub worms in the, in the wild or what the purpose of What's the long him? bill is. Pardon? What's wrong with this bird? Um, he just couldn't be kept by his owner because she traveled too much. Hi, Kiki. I mean, have you ever put a value on your birds? I mean, some of these birds I know are five and ten thousand mm dollars. -hmm. How much value have all these birds? Here? I have absolutely no idea. In in our case, they don't hold very much of a monetary value because some of them are totally unhandleable. Others are sick and injured and really don't have a dollar value to the general public. Can you believe all this started in 1992 when Mary took in one blind bird in need of care? Now look, she has given a home, her home to hundreds of birds who otherwise would have very little future. Another room of birds. Now Jack, this was our second addition to the house. We had 24 birds when we put this room on. 
and um, there's a large variety of birds in here. Um, most of these birds are in normal condition. Uh, a lot of times pet bird owners just don't know what they're getting into when they purchase a bird. They haven't done their homework. They don't realize the amount of time it takes to care for one of these birds. Well, look at that, that bird there is like a $12,000 bird. That's right. He's the highest in macaw. Well, look at, he looks like a plucked chicken. I know. He was um, given to a zoo some years ago and he could not conform to um, a breeding environment because he was human bonded. And so, as a result, he took his frustrations out on himself and plucked his feathers. No, oh, they grow back? No, he won't grow back. Oh, really? No. Jack, do you know what that is? Looks like a nut. Mm-hmm. It's a macadamia nut. It's one I, of the hardest nuts in the world. It is hard. Now, watch how he cuts through this. The reason he has so much strength in his beak... Yeah. Isn't that something? Because that, that thing is hard to hit with a hammer. Yeah. I've hit, hammer, I hit it with a hammer eight times before I can break one with a hammer. So how does he do it? Finds a hole? Or? Well, he tries to find a groove, but if he can't find a groove, he'll make a groove all the way around it with his lower beak, which works like a chisel, and then he'll crack it open. You know, I tell people, this is exactly why I tell people about a bird like this, mm -hmm. why not to have as a pet, because they can take your finger off. Well, see, these birds are considered gentle giants in captivity as pets, but if you don't know how to control them, you can easily lose a finger, a hand, whatever. Oh, okay. Now there is one real unusual bird I'd like to show you in here, if All I may. Right. And she's right up here. Come here, sweet pea. It's a rare bird, huh? No, it's a Quaker, but it's a rare condition. You ain't got any eyeballs. No eyes. No eyes? No eyes whatsoever. What happened to his eyes? Hatched out that way. He hatched out with no eyes? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Golly, I don't understand, how does a bird live with no eyes? Well, the, he has his whole cage memorized and he's never had sight, so he doesn't know to miss it. Look at him, he looks like he enjoys life. Well, yeah, as long as he's getting along fine and he, he eats well, he plays, he constantly plays with his toys. If he's not asleep or eating, he's playing. Mary does much more than just save these birds. She goes above and beyond the call of duty by tending to each bird's individual needs. I saw this firsthand as Mary and her husband, John, treated a cockatoo in their living room, which also serves as a medical center. Well, Todd, unfortunately, uh, self-mutilates his body, and he literally bites into his skin. So daily, we have to give him bandage dressing changes. We've been working with Todd for 10 months, and um, we have not been able to get the wound to heal, and we haven't found anyone that knows why, but we're determined to continue to work with him. Well, this looks like a great kitchen here. Well, this was a small bedroom originally. We converted it to a kitchenette to prepare food for the birds. They eat daily foods such as almonds, macadamia nuts, walnuts, peanuts, seed mixes. I mean, this is an expensive proposition here. It's very expensive. Our total operating costs are well over $2,000 a month. Wow. And, and how many birds right now? 215. 215 birds. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason we do it so well here is we're creating an environment for birds to be birds. These birds have not passed the test as being adequate for pets or for breeding, so we're giving them an environment where they can live the rest of their life out and, and become a bird. Now, do you have some place out there, out there, like there's some more birds around here? Yes, we have a huge aviary that we're going to show you next. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. i to see that. Okay. Can I take a nut? Sure. As Animal Adventures continues. Now that the Tropics Exotic Bird Refuge in Kannapolis, North Carolina is on the map, the house at 2401 Woodsdale Street is taking in more homeless birds than ever. With the total surpassing 200 birds, Mary Bradford had to build a backyard annex. This is one aviary I had to see. Jack, it's real noisy in here. Would you care for some airplugs? No, I've heard a lot of birds. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's wrong? Oh, that's piercing. <laughs> that is piercing. I, see, I'm not used to them in a, in a room like that. Just stick these in your ears? Yep. Man, that's like, that's like being in an airport, but it's real noisy. I'm ready now. You ready? You sure? <laughs> oh, that's much better. Feel better? Yeah, I don't feel uh, Wow, how many birds are in here? There's about 175 birds in here. Wait a minute, I, I, I stuck in the air, so far I can't hear. I'm sorry, not. 175 birds in here. 
of all different species and colors Look, and sizes. Look at this. They're macaw parrots, parakeets. Mm -hmm. All kind of funny. This is an umbrella cockatoo, and he likes to sing and dance. He dances? Yeah. Come here. Come here, Coco. Hi, Coco. Hi. <laughs> Can you sing? Can you sing? Happy birthday? Oh, hello, Coco. I'm Dirt Coco. What you doing, Coco? What? Now, where'd you get this bird? Well, this bird actually came from Long Island, New York. Um, he was a rescue bird and brought in by a bird club up there that I spoke to. He was adopted out to a member of the club, but because he bites so bad, they couldn't keep him. And so we came home with him from New York. He bites. Okay, go back here. You know, I can see why you call this the tropics. It sounds like a rainforest does, in here. It does. With every turn we make, I'm amazed at the sights and sounds. I hear somebody talking up here. Yeah, you hear Charlie. This is a yellow-nailed Amazon. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Come out. Will you come out? No? Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Well, hi, Rupert. How are you? Hello. How are you? What's that? Well, what are you doing? These birds just sit and talk to each other all day yep. long. In fact, it's really funny because instead of squawking to each other, they actually talk back and forth in English. Well, hello, how are you? How are you two doing today? How's it going? Hello. Maybe you could talk to me. No one else talk? Imagine that. A room full of talking birds. And not one of them will give me a hello. But they sure were noisy. Wow, that is impressive. It's a lot of birds, isn't it? They all look happy, too. Well, good, I'm glad. From the look and sound of things, not only are the birds happy, but with the help of the tropics, Mary's birds are making a lot of people happy, too. <laughs> when Jack Hanna's Animal Adventures continues, Mary takes her birds on a field trip to visit some very special friends. Mary Bradford and the Tropics Exotic Bird Refuge do a great job of providing care for sick or handicapped birds. After a tour of the aviary at the refuge, we hit the road with a carload of birds. Our destination, the First Assembly Christian School in Concord, North Carolina, where there's an auditorium full of curious little people eager to meet Mary and hear about her special birds. Birds ready? Mm-hmm. They like riding in the car? <laughs> Some of them, some of them um, try to outdo the radio, <laughs> or me. Okay, come on, birds. Mary takes her birds to school all over the place. She says that instilling the love of these birds in children is key to caring for animals for years to come. Hi, everyone. Hello. Mary's going to talk to you about birds today, right, Mary? Yep. Now, this is Scarlet. Hi, Scarlet. Now, she looks kind of funny, doesn't she? What's wrong with her looks? Well, the reason we do the school programs is to educate the younger generation because most of the birds we have here are going to outlive us, our children's generation, and into our grandchildren's generation. This is Kiwi. <laughs> now, Kiwi is called Lovebird. And we've had Kiwi a very long time. And if he were... <laughs> <laughs> told you, told you he'd fly, didn't I? Yeah. He said my hair, huh? Where our focus on education is to reach younger children, to get them interested in birds now, and hopefully we can raise up some people to come after us. The most unsure position for a bird to be in is on their back, because they can't fly away, they can't stand up and walk away. So in order for you to do this with a bird, they have to love you and trust you very much. Otherwise, you can't do it. 
It's obvious that these birds love and trust Mary totally. I think the kids really enjoyed learning about Mary's feathered family. Hold on, hold on. And the birds had a great time using me as a perch. Now look at three birds. You think I can do four birds? There's a red bird, there's a white bird, and there's a little bird. Oh wait, here's a fourth bird. So thanks, thanks for coming to the bird show today. You all been very, very good. Thank you so much. Bye bye. But presenting school programs isn't the only thing that keeps Mary Bradford busy outside the Tropics Bird Refuge. She also brings her feathered friends to local nursing homes. Hi, ladies. Aren't they beautiful? Isn't she? This is Orco. The reason we do the nursing home programs is that so many little miracles have happened with our birds. We've seen stroke victims that couldn't talk or, or move because of paralysis actually reach up and lift a hand to pet a bird or to speak their first word. You pretty girl? You like it here, don't you? Yeah. It's easy to see how much Mary's visits with her birds mean to the elderly residents here. Not only are the birds fascinating to watch, they give a great deal of joy and happiness to these folks. The elderly, they need the diversion, but they also need the, the closeness that the birds give them because these birds are just literally cuddle up in their arms like a baby and just get the love they need. Oh. <laughs> Mary's home is already so full. I wondered how many more birds she's planning to take in. We haven't set a number limit. Um, we're doing our second aviary now. It's almost complete. And our vision for the future is to build a geodesic type dome, which would imitate a rainforest habitat. Mary Bradford has held all kinds of jobs from a school bus driver to computer sales but now her life is helping unwanted and handicapped tropical birds. Mary says it's an experience that's filled her with a real sense of purpose. They know when to curl up in your lap and make you feel good, and the birds know when to make you laugh, and they know when to cuddle with you, and, and they, they kind of feed off of us and, and back and forth, and, and so I think it's a mutual understanding that we have of each other, and, and it fills our lives. Mary Bradford is a true inspiration. Watching her treat those birds with such loving care, I was reminded that we should cherish all the animals of the earth and find our own special way to give back.